uh, I'm going to talk today really more about an application um, of chaos geometry, specifically random tessellations um, in statistical learning theory. And the motivation comes from uh, random forest prediction. So the problem setting, the goal we have here is uh, we're given example input-output pairs, and we want to obtain some estimator that will predict an output from some new input x. Um, so this includes you know, regression and then classification. And random forests are a popular class of algorithms for performing the task. Um, you know, of course, deep learning has sort of outpaced uh, the uh, random forest in many applications, but they're still very widely used and achieve state-of-the-art uh, performance in, in, in many applications. They're also often preferred uh, in certain applications because of their relative sort of interpretability and explainability as compared to deep learning. Um, and this is because the, uh, the structure of random forests are that they are ensembles of randomized decision trees. So randomized, a randomized decision tree estimator is obtained by um, recursively splitting the data along a random feature of the input. And so you get this uh, random binary tree that splits up your data into these leaf nodes. And this simultaneously induces a hierarchical axis aligned partition uh, of your input space. A random tree estimator in the regression setting, which is the main setting of uh, this talk, will be um, to, for some new input x, you look at the neighbors um, in the same cell of this partition as you, and you average the outputs corresponding to the inputs uh, that lie in the same cell. So it's this sort of um, a nearest neighbor type of estimator where you look to your neighbors to obtain your prediction um, but the neighbors are determined by this random uh, partition of your space, and your neighbors are, are, are the training data that are in the same cell as you. So random forests um, are obtained by taking the average of m iid tree estimators. So the function that you get is this random piecewise constant function that's constant over the cells of the partition. Um, that's induced by superimposing the partitions associated with each tree. Now, the original random forest algorithm, um, the, uh, you know, sort of the off-the-shelf popular uh, random forest algorithm that was developed um, in over the late, uh, sort of in the late '90s, but really popularized by Ryman in, in 2001, generates this random partition. Um, in a very data dependent, using in a very data dependent way, so a random um, subset of the features or dimensions of the input are chosen, but then the split is made in a way that minimizes uh, amongst all the possible splits along all those possible dimensions. A split is chosen that minimizes the variance in the resulting cells um, generated by that split. Um, so this creates sort of this data adaptive partition that learns kind of a good similarity metric um, between your points um, by sort of grouping similar points in, in, in the cell together. But this sort of data dependency of this random partitioning process makes the algorithm very difficult to analyze. And it's, even though there's been recent progress and there's more theory than for things like um, neural networks, there's, it's sort of the, still the same story where there's really a lack of theoretical guarantees that come close to um, explaining the, the performance of the algorithm in practice with really this. So at some point, the, um, in order to sort of study um, the theoretical properties of this algorithm, people started studying simplified versions uh, called purely random forest variants where the partition of the input space that's generated uh, is independent of the data. And an important, um, uh, an important class of purely random forest variants that I want to talk about uh, are generated by what's called the Mondrian process. So in, in machine learning, the Mondrian process was introduced in the machine learning literature by Roy and Tay in 2008. And it's a stochastic process that over time recursively builds an axis-aligned hierarchical partition 
uh, and it's uh, well-defined in, in any dimension D. And uh, it was, of course, named uh, for the painter. And this is just for fun, a two-dimensional sample of a Mondrian that's sort of painted into what looks like uh, a Mondrian painting. Um, so this was, um, there are many, I would say, like uh, nice properties of this process from sort of an algorithmic perspective, um, and which is sort of the main reasons why it was introduced. But what I want to focus on is that they actually turned out to be a very nice class of purely random forest variants from a theoretical perspective, because they were the first ever class of random forests to achieve minimax optimal um, convergence rates in arbitrary dimension. So I'll talk a little bit more later about specifically what it means to achieve uh, minimax optimal rates, but in some sort of um, asymptotic worst case sense, these, this class of random forests um, achieves the best possible um, error rate as the amount of data uh, goes to infinity. Okay, so uh, there's a really uh, nice story here, which is actually that the Mondrian process, which was introduced in the machine learning literature, um, is actually a special case. Oh, I'm so sorry, I forgot. I'll reorder my slides. I, before I say what I was going to say, um, I just want to quickly give a, a description of the construction of a Mondrian process. Okay, so we're going to start with an axis aligned box uh, in RD and fix some a lifetime parameter lambda. We're going to start an exponential clock whose parameter is given by the sum of the widths of this box in each dimension. When this clock rings, if we've already passed our lifetime, uh, then we stop the process. Otherwise, we sample a split by choosing a dimension with probabilities proportional to the width of the box in that dimension. And then conditioned on that dimension, we choose a uniform split along the interval uh, defined by the width of that box in that dimension. We then recurse independently on each subrectangle with a lifetime given by the original lifetime minus the time that's already passed. And so the longer the lifetime, so the, the longer uh, this process runs, the more complex your partition gets. Okay, so it turns out that this uh, construction is actually a special case of something called the stable under iteration process in stochastic geometry. And this is actually introduced um, five years earlier than the Mondrian process, but in the stochastic geometry literature. And so the authors who um, developed the Mondrian process in machine learning were sort of unaware of this existing and, and more general um, class of random partitioning processes. So this um, uh, is stable under iteration processes or STIT processes were introduced by Nagel and Weiss in 2003. And it's, they're much more general in the sense that they're indexed by a directional distribution on the unit sphere. So these are probability measures on the unit sphere that are even and contain, uh, make the assumption that they contain D, linearly independent unit vectors in their support. That ensures that the, the cells of the resulting partition are almost surely bounded. And this is a sample of a STIP process where this directional distribution is uniform over the unit sphere. And you can get the special case of the Mondrian process is obtained when you let this directional distribution um, have support on the standard unit vectors. It's a uniform distribution on the standard unit vectors. So this is um, uh, really nice from the application point of view, actually, because one of the limitations of Mondrian processes and you know, the, the most popular versions of uh, random forests is that they're restricted to these axis aligned splits. So you only use one feature or dimension of the data every time you make a split, which makes it hard to kind of capture dependencies between features intuitively. Yeah? With this algorithm, why don't how do you not overfitting? Like an overfitting problem when you have like so much freedom? When um like generalization now. Uh specifically what about this yeah. Yeah. Oh. oh okay, okay. Um so uh so the, the danger, there is over, a danger of overfitting, 
with the axis aligned sort of uh, um, when you restrict to the axis aligned case because you know, to get a good sort of decision boundary, you may need to run the process along because you're restricted to these sort of axis aligned decision boundaries. So intuitively, if you have access to oblique splits, you might be able to more efficiently um, partition your data and uh, avoid overfitting. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, there have been, you know, many variants of the random forest algorithm that have been introdu introduced in the machine learning literature um, that, all, that show improved empirical performance for many tasks. Um, in fact, and there was even actually one paper um, that noticed the connection between monitoring processes and this general SIP processes and did an empirical study with uh, uniform uh, SIP random forests, which showed improved imp uh, empirical performance over, over the monitoring random forest. But, you know, these, these, these variants have even less sort of theory behind them um, because the general cell shapes, you know, introduce challenges. There's also additional sort of computational costs associated with them. And so um, what uh, my work um, uh, and my goal has been, it has been to sort of bring in some more additional theory from stochastic geometry on random tessellations and, and the SIP process in order to sort of uh, address the, the theoretical challenges um, uh, posed by sort of an analyzing uh, these variants. And understanding, you know, why they why they perform better um, than the axis line versions. Okay. So um, the first thing that we did was we tried to um, was we generalized uh, the result I mentioned earlier about uh, monitoring random forests achieving minimax optimal rates of convergence. Okay. So now we're ha now we're considering. Um, a general uh, SIP forest estimator um, obtained um, a general SIP forest estimators. And to sort of set up the result, we assume a standard you know, uh, regression setting where we have n IID sample input output pairs um, from a random pair XY such that uh, we assume that the input random variable is supported on a convex body in RD. And uh, y is some unknown function f of x plus some noise. Uh, I, ha I haven't written here, but we assume the noise is independent of x and y. It has mean zero and, and finite variance. And then f hat is going to be our stit random forest estimator of f, which is the average of m stit random, uh, randomized decision trees, all with the same lifetime lambda and fixed, all with the same fixed direction distribution. So this, is, uh, uh, this was joint work with Noctran. Um, and our first result says that if we assume that F is L Lipschitz, then if we tune the lifetime parameter, uh, which is you know, really a complexity parameter uh, for, our, uh, for our estimator, if we tune the lifetime to grow like n to the one over d plus two, as n, the amount of data we have, then we get an upper bound on the quadratic risk of our estimator, which measures the error of our estimator by taking the expected value of the squared difference uh, of our estimator minus this true function f uh, evaluated at the random input. And so we obtain an upper bound on this risk bound or generalization error um, that decays like n to the negative 2 over d plus 2 as n goes to infinity. And this is, in fact, the, what's called the minimax optimal rate of convergence for this Lipschitz function class. Um, and what I mean by that is that if you put sort of a soup over all Lipschitz functions in front of this uh, risk, then there's a lower bound on that worst case error that decays like n to negative 2 over d plus 2. So in the worst case for this function class, you can't get a better rate of convergence with n. So um, one thing to note about this result is that I've only tuned the lifetime parameter. I haven't said anything about the number of trees. Um, and so even just a single step randomized decision tree achieves this um, optimal rate of convergence. But we see the advantage of averaging 
um, many trees in a second result, which says that, uh, makes a stronger assumption on F, which is that if it's twice differentiable, then um, if we, we can tune the lifetime parameter um, and ensure that there are, and if we ensure that there are enough trees, if the, if the number of trees that we're averaging grows fast enough with N, then we get an improved uh, upper bound and an improved rate of convergence. In this case, we do need to make some additional like, technical assumptions about we need x has need, needs a positive and this density on its support. Um, and we also have this edge effect where we need to condition on the input being a bit away from the boundary. And I apologize because I, I did just realize there before I said I'm using epsilon here twice, and that's bad. Totally different epsilons. Uh, <laughs> epsilon there is noise. Epsilon here is just a small distance, uh, fixed distance away from the boundary. Okay, so and this, this improved rate of convergence that we get is the minimax optimal rate of convergence for um, uh, C2 functions. How is your dependency, uh, but you have some dependency in epsilon in this bound, right? Uh, yes, yes, absorbed into the, the big O. Oh. Yeah. yeah, if you, uh, yeah. So two things I want to, um, two sort of related observations I want to make about these uh, rates of convergence. One is that just as an artifact of the, of, the, of the function classes that we've chosen, these rates suffer from the curse of dimensionality and that if dimension D is large, these rates are very slow. This is just a fact. This is the best rates we can get for the worst case over these very general uh, function classes. And then also, again, because you know, this is the best rate we can obtain, the rate itself, of course, doesn't depend on the directional distribution. For any fixed directional distribution that you choose, you get the minimax optimal convergence rate. Now, I've absorbed into this big end notation constants that absolutely depend on the directional distribution, um, but the rates, the rates themselves don't. And so um, I want to sort of my work uh, since this result from a few years ago now um, has been to try to understand because you know these results while sort of the first um, while while you know the optimal rates for this large class of random forests with um, oblique splits um, it doesn't highlight any advantage of using oblique splits over the monitoring process over access line splits it doesn't sort of provide any justification for why these might perform better um, in practice over the Mondrian. And so, um, so to have the simultaneous goal of sort of addressing this question of Fritz dimensionality and also uh, trying to understand why oblique splits uh, might lead to better performance. So uh, leading up to that result, though, I want to give some, uh, some background uh, on the SIP process and, and random tessellations, all leading up to, I want to show you the full upper bound here um, so that I can describe sort of the intuition of what we, what we need to do to maybe obtain some improved rates. So yeah, once we see sort of the constants that do depend on the directional distribution, maybe we can see uh, how we might want to adapt that directional distribution um, in order to obtain improved rates. Yeah. Any questions like those algorithms they have some imports on like somehow like marginals of those functions? Marginals of the function. Like a projection of this function on one direction. Oh, um, projection of the function. Oh, the X is like a project of some direction. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, is that, yeah. What, is that thing? Okay. Okay, yeah, exactly. I'll get there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, so yeah. So first I want to go through, you know, the idea of the proof of those results that will lead into sort of how we can improve rates. So the first uh, thing is, of course, the first step is to do a standard bias variance decomposition that we saw in, in, in Gill's talk as well uh, yesterday. Um, and so I remember here that actually, so here, since we also have a random estimator, this expected risk is actually, you have this additional randomness coming from the partition, so you're also taking the expectation with respect uh, to that randomness. And, but we have this bias variance decomposition, so we decompose our risk into the bias or approximation error, which measures you know, the error between our true function and sort of conditioned on the tessellation, you have this class of 
uh, piecewise constant functions that are constant over the cells of the, of the tessellation, um, that your estimator is a member of, of this class. So this is like measure of the error between F and the best the possible approximating function from this piecewise constant uh, function class. And then you also have the uh, variance or estimation error coming from the fact that we only have n data points uh, to obtain an estimator from this class. Okay. So the idea is that these, uh, uh, this risk, this bias and variance, can be controlled by properties of the random tessellation. So in particular, under the regularity conditions of the function, the bias is controlled by the diameter of the cell that contains x. And the variance is, uh, can be shown to be controlled by the expected number of cells uh, that intersect the support of, of your input random variable. And so in the case of the Mondrian process, um, directly from the construction, you can compute these quantities. Um, this is how the, the, the min-x rates were, were proved previously. Um, like, in, in, for example, in the case of the bias, we actually know the exact distribution of a cell that contains a point x. Um, it's an axis aligned box whose widths um, in each dimension are independent random variables that are the sums of two exponential random variables. From x, you sort of have an exponential random variable until you hit uh, boundary one direction, an exponential random variable until you hit the boundary in the other direction. So you can sort of directly compute the diameter. Um, but for more general SIP processes, um, you know, the, the techniques used in the Mondry process case don't extend. Uh, and so uh, we brought in just some additional theory from uh, random tessellations in order to uh, bound these quantities. Okay, so some additional background. Uh, first, just on uh, SID tessellations and more general rate stationary, stationary random tessellations. So we have this uh, SID process um, uh, construction on a compact and convex window. And uh, I meant to mention earlier, so it's, the construction is, is you know, very similar to what I described for the monitoring process, obviously. The monitoring process is just a special case of this. In the, in the more general setting, um, when you want to make, when you want to split a cell, um, you have some exponential lifetime, or an exponential clock that you assign to the cell, whose parameter depends on the directional distribution. And then when you make a split, you choose a direction, um, from the distribution over the sphere that's given by the directional distribution weighted by the widths of the cell in each direction, and then conditioned on the direction you cut uniformly um, along the interval that defines the width of your cell in that direction. So that's, that's kind of the generalization, but we have this um, similar construction for any compact and convex window. And this construction satisfies the consistency property where if you run this process on a large window, intersect with a small window, you recover in distribution uh, the, the, uh, the partition or the tessellation that you would have gotten had you run the, part, run the process on that smaller window. And this implies uh, the existence of a stationary sit tessellation on all of our D, such that if you intersect this infinite tessellation with a compact window, you recover in distribution the tessellation obtained by this uh, of, uh, the process constructed on, on the compact window. This uh, stationary tessellation on all of our D also satisfies the stable under iteration property, which is where it, it gets its name. So to iterate, a random tessellation means to subdivide all of the cells of that tessellation with an independent copy of the tessellation restricted to each cell. And if you iterate uh, a tessellation n times, and scale um, all of the boundaries by n, then if you recover in distribution of your original tessellation, you are stable under iteration. And in particular, this property implies this very important scaling property that we're going to use, which is that if you have a sit tessellation of lifetime parameter lambda, and you scale all the boundaries by lambda, you re recover in distribution a sit tessellation with lifetime parameter Um, okay, so a little bit on sort of general stationary random tessellations, of which the stationary stit tessellation is, is just one example. So the cells of a stationary random tessellation 
form a stationary point process on this basis of convex, convex polytopes. And there are two particular random polytopes that are studied in relationship to a stationary random tessellation. Um, one is the zero cell, which is the cell that contains the unique cell that contains the origin, and by stationarity has the same distribution as the cell that um, contains any fixed point x and rd translated so that x is at the origin. And the other cell um, is called the typical cell, which there's a number of ways to define this, but an intuitive explanation is if you take sort of a large ball and, and you sample um, a polytope uniformly at random from the set of polytopes that uh, intersect that ball, and you translate it so it's uh, center is at the origin, then uh, as you let the radius of that ball go to infinity, the distribution of that random polytope converges to uh, the, tip of the distribution of the typical cell. But also by an application of Campbell's formula, we have this really useful um, formula, which is that the expected number of cells in the uh, stationary random tessellation that have, so, have a given property can be written in terms, of, uh, in terms of this expression that just depends on this single random polytope. Uh, the single uh, typical cell. So I, I want to note here that um, it's known that the, the interior of the typical cell of a sit tessellation actually has the same distribution as a more classical stationary random tessellation model, uh, the, Poisson hyper, the stationary Poisson hyperplane tessellation with matching parameters. So if you haven't seen the stable under iteration tessellation before, but maybe you're familiar with the Poisson hyperplane tessellation, um, so all of the results about the typical cell and zero cell of these random tessellations can sort of be imported uh, for the SID tessellation as well, uh, um, if you have matching parameters. So the Poisson hyperplane tessellation is also uh, parameterized by um, a lambda called the intensity and a directional distribution. So if those two things match for the STIT and the Poisson hyperplane tessellation, uh, you have this equality and distribution of the typical and, and which implies equality and distribution of the zero cell. So actually, I want to mention that um, uh, for the remainder of the talk, actually all of the theory that's been developed so far um, in this application only relies on the geometry of the typical cell and the zero cell. Um, so, you could also define an estimator um, where you partition your data with a Poisson hyperplane tessellation, and then you average the outputs uh, over for all the inputs that are in the same cell of uh, the same cells um, of, of that tessellation, and all of the theory would go through for those that estimator as well. Um, I'm going to stick with you know sit tessellations. Because you know, from the application point of view, and there are sort of algorithmic reasons why the hierarchical structure is, is nice, but out from the theoretical side, um, everything here also actually applies to this sort of alternative random partition estimator. So you can, uh, if you like, prefer Poisson hyperplanes, you can replace when they say sit tessellation with Poisson hyperplane tessellation in the, in the rest of the talk. Okay. So um, an important consequence of this um, formula here for the typical cell, involving the typical cell, is an important lemma in our, uh, in our proof of these risk bounds, which is, so recall I said the variance of these different random forests are controlled by the expected number of cells that intersect uh, the support of our input random variable. And using that previous formula, we can um, compute the expected, uh, this expected number of cells. We can compute the expected number of cells that intersect any compact uh, convex window W. And so the ingredients here of this lemma that are this into that go into this equality are the formula I showed on the previous page, then Steiner's formula, then the scaling property of the sit tessellations, which mean that you know, like the typical cell of a sit tessellation with lifetime lambda has the same distribution as 
1 over lambda times the typical cell of acid tessellation with unit lifetime. So we're basically, we, can, we extract um, the lambda parameter out, and we get a polynomial um, for this quantity in lambda, and the coefficients are mixed volumes of the typical cell of, of the sit tessellation with lifetime one and, and the compact set. So one last thing I want to discuss before showing you sort of the full upper bound on, on the risk is another parameter uh, called the associated zonoid. So if you have lifetime lambda and directional distribution phi, this is the convex body, or specifically a, a, a zonoid, that has this support function. So the associated measure on the sphere um, for the zonoid is lambda over two times the directional distribution. And this, uh, the geometry of this convex body is sort of associated to different statistics of the um, uh, of the random tessellation, of the SIT tessellation. So intuitively, so some examples for like for Mondrian processes, the associated zonoids are L infinity balls. For the uniform SIT, the, um, uh, the associated zonoids are L2 balls. And here's sort of a weighted, uh, just sort of a, a drawing for, for the weighted Mondrian of like approximate correspondence between what the associated zonoids would look like and the zero cell. And in particular, an important property is that so the widths, or the support, sorry, the support function of the um, uh, zonoid in a given direction determines the intersection density of the put of the sit tessellation with a line in that direction. So if your associated zonoid has a larger support function in a given direction, then the intersection of your random tessellation with this line is going to be um, uh, a Poisson process with a larger intensity. The, int the, the intersection um, intensity is going to be larger. And then, if you, but if you have a smaller width, then you're sort of cutting up in that direction less. The intensity, the intersection intensity is, it is smaller. Okay. Okay, so, so now uh, with, all of, with all of that, uh, we can give sort of the full upper bound on the risk or generalization error of our stit random forests. So just again, recall the, the, the regression setting that we're in, which is that we have n input-output pairs, which are um, IID samples of some random pair xy. And we're going to sort of make the sort of simplifying assumption now that x, the support of x is contained in the unit ball. Um, and y is some other function of f of x plus some independent noise between 0 and variance of squared. So f hat, again, is going to be our stit forest estimator, which is obtained uh, by averaging m stit randomized decision trees, all with lifetime lambda and fixed directional distribution. Um, and now z naught is going to be the zero cell of the stit tessellation with lifetime 1. And here's our full upper bound in the Lipschitz case. So we assume we have our function um, that's now assumed, uh, uh, our inputs assumed to be supported on the unit ball. Assume our function is L Lipschitz. Then our upper bound is given by, the first term is an upper bound on the bias, which is on the order of 1 over lambda squared. Um, and the, the constant there is the second moment of the diameter of the zero cell. And then we have the variance term, which comes from the lemma on the previous, uh, a few slides ago, um, where uh, we've sort of simplified things by assuming that the support is contained in the unit ball and using the fact that sort of the expected value of intrinsic volumes of the typical cell correspond to um, uh, intrinsic volumes of the associated zonoid divided by the volume of the associated zonoid. So, so we have a known fact um, about typical cells of Poisson hyperplane tessellations that we use to sort of simplify uh, the variance term here. Okay. Any questions at, at all? 
Okay, so basically to get the to get the sort of uh, the result, the minimax convergence rate, the main thing we just need to kind of confirm is that the second moment of the diameter is bounded, um, which we can extract from this paper by Hugh and Schneider, which has many nice results, but one thing you can, <laughs> one of the many things you can extract from a paper is sort of a tail bound on the diameter of the zero cell. So an exact expression for this is not known for general directional distributions, but um, there is a, uh, uh, you can extract from that paper a tail bound, which implies that the second moment is, is bounded, um, but there is this unknown constant that does depend on the directional distribution. But since it's bounded, we can just sort of minimize this upper bound with respect to lambda to find the optimal tuning we need to obtain that convergence rate, right? Because we have this sort of bias variance trade-off, as they call it, where with a, a larger lambda, you, your variance is higher um, and your bias is smaller, but with a smaller, um, a, a smaller complexity parameter, your uh, bias is larger. And so there's sort of this optimal uh, there's this trade-off, and you sort of want to find the optimal uh, lambda that balances that. Okay. So uh, now, as I said, what we really want to do is uh, how can we, you know, um, sort of try to overcome the cursive dimensionality um, the, uh, that, that shows up in these convergence rates? Well. What we need to do for sure is make some additional assumptions uh, about our random variable x, y, our data generating process, um, because those rates are sort of an artifact of that function class that we assumed. And so we need to assume some additional structure. Now, one first thing we can do, um, which leads very immediately to improved rates, but makes a very strong assumption, is that we can assume that our Input um, our input random variable is supported on a lower dimensional subspace of R D. Um, so I mean, obviously, if we knew which subspace this was, we would just you know partition that subspace and, and, and be done. But let's say we we know it's lower dimensional, but we don't know what the subspace is. So very immediately we can get improved rates here because. Um, it's known that if you take a SIT tessellation and you intersect an RD and you intersect it with a subspace, a lower dimensional subspace, dimension S, then the induced partition on that subspace is also a SIT tessellation whose associated zonoid is the projection of the associated zonoid of the SIT, the SIT tessellation in RD onto that subspace. And so very immediately, you know, we can basically just think about, we can just treat this um, estimator as if it's a SIT tessellation forest estimator in that subspace, even though we don't know where that subspace is and we've partitioned all of our D. And this is true for any directional distribution. Um, and so what happens is that basically uh, in the variance term, we can get an improved, uh, without increasing the bias, we can decrease the dependence of uh, the variance on lambda and see that it's actually on the order of lambda to the S, because intrinsic volumes of the projection of the associated zonoid onto our subspace for K larger than S are zero. And so all those terms just go away, and we immediately can tune lambda now appropriately to get a minimax optimal rate for functions on RS. However, this is a very, very strong assumption about the input data that's, you know, sort of, I'm sure, very rarely. Uh, uh, satisfied in practice, and a much more common sort of linear dimension reduction model that's used is uh, studied is something called a ridge function or a multi-index model, depending on the literature you're looking at. And this model is it assumes that instead of your input random variable lying in a lower dimensional subspace, it assumes that your function only depends on the projection of your input onto a lower dimensional subspace. And so uh, we'll call this lower, this sort of, um, uh, this lower dimensional subspace that, for which the projection of your input uh, gives you, um, is what your function depends on. We'll call this the, the relevant feature subspace. And these are some pictures that uh, just give some intuition about why this is 
a lot harder than the first case. So, I mean, blind dimension two, uh, which is all I can draw, but uh, if you have a, your data, if your data, like your input data actually lies in lower dimensional subspace. So if any, you know, uh, any sort of partition um, of your ambient space is going to group together um, similar points um, in that subspace. And you're still gonna get a relatively good sort of partition of that subspace for any sort of partition of your ambient space. But now if your input data is allowed to sort of be full dimensional um, and you sort of pick any uh, general uh, random partition of your space, what can happen is that you separate points that are far away in RD, but when they're projected, like these two points here, when they're projected onto the subspace, they're actually very close, they're very similar, but this, this partition separates them, and they're very likely to be um, separated unless you adapt the geometry of that partition to the subspace where you're really only splitting um, with hyperplanes that have normal vectors close to uh, this relevant feature subspace. Yeah. So it really seems like in this case we need something much stronger. Okay, so um, to, to sort of quantify that, we have this alternative uh, risk upper bound for ridge functions. So an equivalent assumption is that, again, our function is some g tilde of the orthogonal projection uh, of our input x onto this relevant feature subspace. And again, we let F hat be our sit force estimator. And now we have this sort of alternative upper bound in the Lipschitz case, where the bias now depends on the second moment of the diameter of the projection of the zero cell onto our relevant feature subspace. And the variance, we can sort of split up terms now where um, we have this, uh, this term that is on the order of lambda to the S, which is kind of ideally what we want, right? And then we have these higher order terms, but um, we can extract this, uh, this constant uh, that's the diameter of the projection of our associated solenoid onto the orthogonal subspace to S. And you know, this sort of, if, if this is, if we let the directional distribution now, and so the associated solenoid and the zero cell depend um, on N as well, so depend on, on, on the data, with the amount of data that we have. If that decays as n grows, then maybe we can you know, cancel out with this lambda and get improved performance, um, improved dependency on n in the variance without um, sacrificing or, or blowing up the, the bias. And, and exactly this, making sure this diameter is small, matches the intuition I was describing on the previous slide, um, which ensures, because this, this diameter of the projection onto the orthogonal subspace of your associated zonoid is small, that means in those directions, you are cutting up less, right? So what we want is we want to be cutting up directions in, um, we want to be uh, our hyperplanes to have normal directions that are close to S, we want to be like cutting up S more and cutting up the orthogonal direction less. So again, here's kind of a close to what we kind of want, a picture of like intuitively what we want. Um, we want, um, uh, if we have, this is our lower dimensional subspace, you know, this is sort of a better partition than an equally weighted Mondrian. Um, and this is, uh, corresponds to this associated zonoid, and we see that the projection of this associated zonoid onto the orthogonal subspace uh, will be smaller, um, indicating that, yeah, like those, uh, we're cutting up those directions less. The intersection densities are smaller. Okay, so what, um, yeah, so now uh, what, do we, what do we wanna do from here? We, I want to use this result to sort of model, uh, to quantify error um, for a situation where um, that models like an algorithm where you use the data to learn a directional distribution and um, 
And then given you know, some, some error between that learned directional distribution and what sort of the ideal directional distribution would be, which would be probability measure supported uh, on the relevant feature subspace, supported in the relevant feature subspace, if we can sort of quantify the error between those two things, we can sort of import that into this upper bound and it hopefully obtain improved convergence rates that depend on how well you're learning that, that directional distribution, or that, how well you're learning the relevant feature subspace in some sense. Okay, so um, it turns out that this is kind of hard to do, uh, a little bit hard to do for general directional distributions. So I'm actually going to, um, uh, for the main result, I'm going to restrict to discrete directional distributions. So I'm going to parameterize these by matrices or linear images A from Rd to Rm that have rank D. This ensures um, the, the property we want that the, um, the support of the directional distribution contains D linearly independent vectors because we're going to use this matrix to define this discrete directional distribution whose support are, you take the rows of this matrix and the directions of those vectors are the support of your directional distribution and the norms determine the weights. Now, why have I parameterized it this way? Well, um, there's another motivation for really sticking to this class of SIP processes, which comes from, uh, which is for computational reasons, and that is um, for this class of discrete directional this class of discrete directional distributions, um, generating a stit tessellation is can actually be reduced to applying this linear transformation A to the inputs, lifting up the, the data set into Rm, and then running a Mondrian process. So we actually don't need to deal with any of the additional complexities of running a SIT tessellation. Um, with more general directional distribution uh, for, uh, in, in this case, um, we can just use our Mondrian process algorithms and all the additional computational cost is absorbed into this linear transformation um, of the data. Uh, so that's so another reason, another justification for kind of restricting and, and focusing on this specific class of, of state random forest estimators. Um, and in this case, we get the following result uh, for ridge functions. We have, um, so recall our ridge functions, we have, we assume that our true function f is some g tilde of the orthogonal projection of x onto our relevant feature subspace. And then we're going to let a n be a sequence of these linear maps, these matrices, um, that, uh, and we're going to assume a normalization that the sum of the um, some of the norms of the rows are equal to one. And these are going to sort of model a set of data-driven choices of split directions or data-driven like uh, choice of, of um, linear transformation of, of the data. And, um, and then we're going to consider the sequence, you know, we're going to consider these the sit random forests where now both the, intent, uh, the lifetime parameter and the directional distribution depend on n. Um, and we have uh, the following result, which gives, so the, remember intuitively what we want for, for uh, to obtain approved, improved rates is for the support of this directional distribution to lie close to the relevant feature subspace or have very small weight. <laughs> um, and so this is, this intuitively is, is quantified in this first assumption, so we're going to bound the sum of the norms of the projection onto the um, orthogonal subspace uh, to S of our, our rows, AI of this matrix. So this either means right, that you are close to um, being in the, to, uh, AIs are close to the subspace S, to being in the span of S, or um, the norm is really small. So the weight is very small, depending in that direction. So we assume that this is bounded above by some epsilon n that is going to zero as n goes to infinity. So we're assuming that as we get more data, we're doing a better and better job. That's where they learn a good, of learning a good set of directions. 
And then we also need this condition that ensures that, you know, since we have this dependence of the directional distribution on N, um, we also need to make sure that we're not also letting the bias, the, the um, diameter of the zero cell in the, uh, in the S directions, in the relevant feature subspace directions. We're not letting that kind of grow also. So we have this, this is um, ensured by uh, assuming a uniform lower bound on the smallest singular value of the projection of a n onto s. Um, so under these two conditions, we have that for, uh, under the assumption that g tilde is Lipschitz, we can tune lambda n um, like uh, to grow like n to the one over d plus two times epsilon n to this power. And we get this, an upper bound that decays um, like n to the negative 2 over d plus 2 times epsilon n to this power as n grows. And since epsilon n goes to 0, so this is an improvement uh, on, the, on the rate, um, the previous rate we saw. And this also gives the condition, so if we, this also gives the condition on how well we need to do, or how well, um, um, a sufficient condition on how well we need to do on approximate, on, on learning these directions um, to obtain the optimal rate of convergence for this class of functions. So in particular, if, um, if epsilon n decays like n to the negative 1 over s plus 2, then we can tune our lifetime parameter uh, to achieve an upper bound on our risk that achieves the minimax optimal rate of convergence for functions on Rs. Um, Okay, so uh, a quick idea of that proof. So it's just a combination of that general bound uh, I showed earlier for risk functions and the fact that for this specific choice of directional distribution, these discrete directional distributions, um, you know, the associated zonoid is a zonotope with the support function. And we can use actually that result I mentioned earlier about that was I mentioned it in the sort of computational algorithmic context where we can generate these tessellations by lifting up the data and running a monitoring process. What this, uh, this argument also gives you is that the zero cell of these tessellations um, has the same distribution as the intersection of the zero cell of a Mondrian intersected with the range of A. Um, and then if you, you map back down to RD with the pseudo inverse of A. Uh, to recover and distribution the zero cell these two tessellations. And this gives us upper bounds on the diameter of um, the second moment of the diameter of the projection of uh, the zero cell onto S, and an upper bound of the diameter of the projection of the associated zonoid onto the orthogonal subspace. So we plug these two things, right? These were the two quantities that showed up in that uh, upper bound for our risk for, for, for ridge functions. We plug those back in, make the assumptions, and, and, and we get the result. OK, um, so the last thing I want to say is that um, so we've sort of seen how uh, we can improve the rates of convergence by sort of a data-driven choice. So we've modeled situation. We have sort of a data-driven choice of the of the directional distribution. And we've seen that to get these improved rates, we really need this directional distribution to adapt to this low dimensional structure. And we need, we need the support of that directional distribution to concentrate um, close to the relevant feature subspace. So to comment on um, the, uh, the other main point I mentioned, which is that our previous result didn't highlight any advantage of oblique splits. Um, this sort of indicates that, okay, so if you have a, um, have a relevant feature subspace that's axis aligned, okay, reweighting uh, a Mondrian should be good because you can, you know, you can reweight re the directions and hopefully uh, learn that you want to weight the directions in the relevant feature subspace more and the directions um, uh, orthogonal to that uh, uh, less. But if your function depends on an oblique relevant feature subspace, 
the Mondrian doesn't have any hope of, no matter what reweighting you do, the Mondrian doesn't have any hope of sort of its support, <laughs> the support of the directional distribution concentrating around that oblique subspace. Um, and so just to make this like a little bit more precise, um, for a Mondrian uh, randomized tree, we actually have a lower bound on, uh, on, the, on the error, on the risk, that, that, that shows this, um, that you have this lower bound that basically no matter what uh, weights you choose, um, decreasing the, um, the order with respect to lambda of, of the variance, you can't do that without blowing up the bias. Um, and so this is just a more justification for uh, what some statistical justification, the theoretical justification um, for why um, uh, oblique splits will perform better uh, in practice over over axis aligned versions. Okay, uh, so that's all. Uh, just to summarize, so, um, you know, the goal of this work was really to try to argue for some theoretical statistical advantages of oblique splits. Uh, we did this by, you know, setting this class of, nice class of random tessellation forests, which achieved approved rates in high dimensions with a good choice of directional distribution, assuming um, these uh, uh, linear dimension reduction models. Uh, and just to mention some future work, so, of course, the main question from uh, this work um, on the application side is, okay, how do you learn <laughs> that directional distribution? You know, that's, uh, how, do you, how do you do a good job of doing it? So I have some ongoing work that is, is wrapping up now where we learn a linear transformation um, and can sort of prove uh, error, error bounds for um, how well that approximates a projection onto the relevant future subspace and import that. You, we can then use this theory and combine to obtain convergence rates for that, that full algorithm. Um, and then another direction I just want to mention, um, because again, we've only assumed like these linear dimension reduction models here, um, which really uh, imply that you have these globally relevant features. Um, and this is captured well by stationary random tessellation. But you know, real world data has much more complex often has much more complex low dimensional structure. Um, and so to adapt to sort of non-linear dimension reduction models, we really need non-stationary random tessellations um, and for, for, to, to capture locally relevant features. So I think sort of to, to further the, uh, to obtain more theoretical guarantees for any algorithms that um, are used in practice and sort of to really match, uh, uh, to explain sort of that performance uh, we sort of need models that, that, that capture, um, that have some non-stationarity. Uh, okay, thank you so much. Uh,